Well, good evening. It's Wednesday. We are into the fourth day of our Bible con online Bible conference. And uh, we're excited for tonight because tonight's going to be a little different. We said this was an international Bible conference. Well, tonight we have an international speaker. Uh, missionary Joe Keem uh, is going to be, Campos, I'm sorry, is going to be joining us from Brazil. So he will actually be speaking from Brazil to us here tonight. And so before we go any farther, though, let's open with a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we are truly thankful tonight that we do have this privilege to once again come together as we continue our uh, online Bible conference. Father, we thank you for the, the messages that we've already heard, the challenge that has been there for uh, evangelism, not just uh, an organized program through the local assembly, but each and every one of us as your ambassadors uh, have been called to, to be your spokesman uh, for Jesus Christ, for the, for the message of salvation, for the uh, winning of the lost. And uh, Father, we truly live in a lost world that desperately needs Jesus Christ. So I pray, Father, that through this week that uh, hearts will be challenged uh, to truly pick up uh, the, the, the load, pick up the burden of, of sharing the gospel, of the saving gospel of the grace of God with a lost world, a lost a nation, a lost state, a lost community. Father, may we gain that vision for even the people who live around us, who we work with uh, for the cause of Christ. So we ask your blessing upon our time together tonight. And uh, Father, use it for your honor and your glory. And we do pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as we begin tonight, uh, I am thankful that uh, you have been with us each night. And I trust each night we've gained additional viewers. And we, we praise the Lord for that. And we're just thankful for the, for the many who we are able to reach with this online Bible conference. And I know by now you, you get the idea that its emphasis is on the area of evangelism. And last summer, uh, Matt did a whole summer of, uh, on the Tuesday Bible time uh, on the subject of evangelism. And actually, we had talked this whole year about being about, about evangelism. And so we're thankful that tonight we can continue our conference on evangelism, and we are night four, it's Wednesday, and like I said, we are an international conference, and so uh, we have uh, our brother, a friend, uh, Pastor Joe Campos from Brazil uh, with us tonight, and we'll get to him in just a few moments, but before we do that, we do need to run through our uh, ordinary little introduction, commercial, whatever it is, but there, we have people that join us. And you say, well, I'm tired of seeing that. But we have people that join us from around the world, around the country, and, and uh, are interested in the materials then and don't know about Bible doctrines to live by. And so this is our way of introducing us to them. And so we just ask your patience as we go through this. But um, you'll notice there on your screen, uh, we do have a, a list of of Bible study materials. So as we said, we are a, a preaching, teaching ministry, but we're also a printing ministry. And, and we teach the Word of God, and we print the Word of God, and, and uh, the Bible study materials to study the Word of God, and to study the Word of God without apology. We, we are a mid-Acts, dispensational, fundamental uh, printing and, and uh, uh, teaching ministry. And we don't apologize for that, and we don't hide that. Uh, so we have Bible study materials, all of it geared uh, to from uh, uh, presented, I should say, from a mid-acts dispensational point of view. Uh, and so we believe in rightly dividing the word of truth. And so all of our materials, all of our teaching materials, all of our uh, mat uh, Bible study materials come from that point of view. We have a, a whole list of, of gospel tracts that are available to you to hand out as evangelists. You can hand out gospel tracts and see people come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have a whole list of graded curriculum. And that, that is excellent. It's for all ages. Uh, it starts down in, in, in uh, the first uh, early grades, preschool, first, second, third grade, all the way up to the teens and even into the adults. And so we have all of that. 
And uh, we'd encourage you to use that. You can use that greater curriculum, a home school, a Sunday school, a youth group, uh, you know, just uh, home devotions for the family devotions. Um, it has such a wide use. And uh, so we would encourage you to check into that. If you don't already use that in your church, we'd encourage you to start using that uh, right away. Get, in, get involved. Uh, you can get the catalog. You see a picture of the catalog there on your screen. To get a catalog, and that contains all of our materials that are available, all you need to do is call our office uh, Monday through Friday, 616-785-3618. Uh, uh, if no one answers, just leave a message. But uh, we are here Monday through Thursday, and so uh, up until 3 o'clock. So you can reach somebody then and just uh, order a catalog. Or if you know what you would like to have, just order that. You can also go to our website at www.bibledoctrines.org. And all of our materials are there. And you can order a catalog for that. Uh, Also, you could send us an email at staff at bibledoctrines.org. And we also have the chronological reading schedule to read through the Bible in a year, and it's not dated, so you can start any time, but it goes through chronologically. That is on the website, and you can download it there. And like we've been saying, uh, if you want to download that for your church and then make 100 copies, you go right ahead and do that. That's perfectly fine. Uh, If you don't have a way of downloading it, just give us a call, and we'll send you a copy of that, uh, and then you can make copies as many as you want. But... um, That is an excellent way of reading through the scriptures, of just seeing the things unfold and and putting the various scriptures that are speaking about the same event, particularly in the so-called Old Testament. Bring those all together and read them at the same time. And so we'd encourage you to, if you haven't yet, uh, to start, uh, but read through the Bible and, and, and think about it and, and study that as you're going, as you're going through. So, so that is available to you, and we'd encourage you to use that. Don't forget, normally, our Tuesday Bible time is at 7 o'clock uh, on Tuesdays. And, of course, this week we had the Bible conference, but next week we'll be back again with the Tuesday night broadcast. So we'd encourage you to, to uh, join with us there as we will then pick up and continue our study in the unfolding of the word of truth. And uh, so, and right now we are at a very key place in that study. Uh, so we'd encourage you, join with us Tuesday night for Tuesday Bible time, 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, right here on uh, Facebook and on our YouTube page. Don't forget also our morning coffee and bite of scripture. Now we had a little bit of a glitch on that one uh, this morning. But um, we're back, and we had that. Every day at 9.30, we have a, a, a little, we have a bite of coffee, a, a cup of coffee, and a bite of Scripture. We go through a little Scripture, have a little devotional, a little challenge there, and then we have prayer requests, and we go to prayer, and we have a time of prayer together. Generally lasts about 15 to 20 minutes-ish. <laughs> I guess that's the way you put it, 20 minutes-ish. And, um, but we have a nice little group of people that meet together every morning, and we'd encourage you to join the family. So that will be there. Uh, so, and then don't forget, Sunday night again, this Sunday night, we'll be back again for our Bible study hour, back at the regular time, 5 o'clock, and that's every Sunday at 5, uh, right here, Eastern Standard Time, we have our Bible study hour. Uh, so uh, we'd encourage you to take part in that and um, take part in all of the ministries that we have here at Bible Doctrines to Live By. Oh, all right. Well, no, I think my, oh, there's one more. I think there's one more. Yes, our coffee cups. Uh, we have those coffee mugs available. They are $14 for, for one, $24 for two. That includes the shipping that has our logo on the one side. And then on the reverse side, it says, right, uh, study, uh, rightly dividing the word of truth, rightly dividing the word of truth. And uh, so it reminds you to pray for us. It reminds you to rightly divide the word of truth. And believe you me, a cup of coffee tastes better in a Bible doctrines to live by cup. And uh, and a cup of hot chocolate, or even once in a while, I'll put in a diet cream soda that tastes better in a Bible doctrines cup. But we, you know, order one of those today 
and to have it ready for you and share it with a friend. It might just, might just start a conversation with what do you mean by rightly dividing the word of truth? Introduce them to the word rightly divided. So, you know, we'd encourage you order a cup and enjoy a cup of coffee. All right. I think that's it for now. Let's move over to our international broadcast tonight. Uh, Joe, Joe Keem, Joe Campos, uh, was born and raised in Brazil, uh, married uh, the daughter of, of um, <laughs> Doug, Doug Lefebvre, very, and uh, has been a missionary there for many years, came back to the States, studied at Grace Christian University, and then he and his wife, Michelle, went back to Brazil, and they are, they are doing a wonderful job down there right now, a tireless job uh, down there uh, serving the Lord, uh, preaching the, the message, uh, the word rightly divided, winning the lost, doing a wonderful job among uh, children uh, through the ABBA ministry that they have. And I believe Joe's going to share some of that with you um, either before or after he speaks tonight. But Joe will share some of that. But you really be in prayer for Joe and Michelle and, and Doug and Vicky and others who are laboring there in Brazil uh, as they share the word of God. It's a, it's a huge country. And they are in a large city and have many things going on. So we just uh, encourage you to be in prayer for those, those who are serving the Lord around the world. Uh, and tonight we think about Joe and Michelle and the ministry that God has given to them there. So I'm going to turn it over to Joe and I'm going to welcome him and we'll have a word of prayer. And uh, then I'm going to step aside and we'll switch it over to Joe and then I will come back later on. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time tonight. We pray that as Joe comes and as he speaks, you might minister through him, through your word, challenge all of us in the area of evangelism. And Father, we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Joe, take it away. Hello, everyone. This is Joe Campos. I'm a missionary with Things to Come Mission in northern Brazil. Like they say here in the middle of the afternoon, boa tarde. So for those that understand uh, a little bit of Portuguese, uh, you know what I'm saying. For those that do not, then you're going to have to keep guessing. Or come and visit me in Brazil and uh, do ministry together here for a period of time. Well, I was uh, very uh, excited you know, to be a part of this conference. And uh, when Matt Ritchie reached out to me and asked me if I could speak to this conference on this very important topic of evangelism, I could just say not anything else but yes. So I'm here to share with you a little bit about evangelism, obviously from a perspective of a missionary. Uh, they not only do the work of evangelism in a daily basis by planting churches, reaching out people, and teaching others to do the same, but also as a product, as a fruit of missionary work done by evangelistic missionaries that took the time to reach out to me. So I'm speaking from both the perspectives. I hope that doing this uh, today, I can be an encouragement to you. I can be a motivator to you. I can challenge you in some way or another how to become more sharper or become sharper in your uh, endeavors to reach people that you know and people that you care about. Uh, by uh, talking about this issue, I believe there's a lot to be said. Um, I'm going to take a, f uh, a focus on it that might be different from the others that are going to speak on this issue. But I'm hoping that by the time we end our time together here, you be uh, more knowledgeable uh, not only in the information aspect of things, but you'll be inspired to get off your behind <laughs> and go out there and try to reach people with the grace of God. And to begin, I'd like to share a little bit of a story that I heard um, many years ago, but I think it's very appropriate for the topic that we're going to be talking about. Um, in the little town in Brazil, there were two women with the same name, and the name was Mary. One was a nun, and the other was a tax driver. Incredibly enough, they both die on the same very day. When they arrive in heaven, Apostle Peter was waiting for them, and what was his name? That's what he asked. 
Are you married the nun or are you married the tax driver? Well, the first one was the married the tax driver told Peter, well, I'm the married the tax driver. So Peter looked in his books, you know, looked it through it, through it saw, saw the records and told Mary the tax driver, well, you're welcome to paradise. Take this crown of gold and enjoy heaven as you're going to spend eternity here. Right after, he asked the other one, you know, the Mary the nun. Well, what's your name? Mary the nun. So, yes, that's me. Well, that's great. Well, welcome to paradise, but there's no crowd for you, unfortunately. But go ahead and enjoy eternity in paradise. Right when he said that, Mary the nun got really upset and says, Well, wait, 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 Peter, there must be a mistake there. I know the other, nun, uh, the other Mary that just walked in here, Mary the tax driver, and you don't understand. I'm a very religious person. I was a nun, you know, and I, I preach all the time in my little community for the woman there until I was 85. So this got to be a mixed up somewhere there. You probably misread the names and you, you know, you, you mixed up, you know, I am supposed to get the crown and she's not supposed to get the crown. There's some kind of a misunderstanding there because I know that woman really well. She's a nut head. She just drove like a maniac. She drove over the sidewalks to have people scream, yelling and you know, uh, trying to to survive when she wasn't in the, in, the, in, the, in the behind the wheel. So I am pretty certain this is not the same Mary you're talking about there. Well, Peter looked at her with his eyes really focused on her face and says, "You know, you probably don't understand how things are done here, but we have a different system that we've been implementing in the last few years." And she just looked at puzzle to him and asked him, "Well, what's this system?" Well, see, here's the thing. We found out that we'd better give people rewards based on result. So, guess what? When we are preaching for the last 85 years, that is, uh, you have said to me, you know, people are most of the time sleeping. While the other Mary, the crazy tax driver, every time she was behind the wheel, she had people in the car and outside of the car praying that they would get saved. So that is just a, a way for you to understand how motivated we can get for evangelism in, from a different perspective. But I, I'm hoping that I'm not giving you ideas that are not very, uh, let's say, biblically correct at least. But sometimes we ran out of ideas in how to lead people to Christ that we might even consider something similar like that. I have, hope you don't do that. But I tell you this story for you to reflect for a minute in your evangelistic lifestyle. One of the most profound and pro provocative questions I have ever been asked in this topic of evangelism has been this. If everybody witnessed like you, would you be safe? If everybody witnessed like you, would you be safe? That makes you think hard, doesn't it? Well, some of you or some of us have beat ourselves over the head, have taken guilt trips upon guilt trips, and we just don't seem to get any better on evangelism. I really think that the problem with this, it is not because of the lack of tools or training in the area, but rather in a proper motivation to do evangelism like we have been taught in Scripture, scripture to do so. So I think the answer to overcome the fear and obstacle of sharing your beliefs with other people is to have a grace perspective of evangelism. It has been absolutely liberating for me to understand evangelism from a grace perspective. And I would like to share with you three, of, well actually four reasons and why it's so liberating and so motivating. So here it is. The number one reason for you to evangelize from a grace perspective as your motivator. Number one, grace compels us to see people as people. Grace compels us to see people as people. In today's churches, evangelism becomes very utilitarian. And people are many times seen as a resource for building the next big church. A grace-motivated outlook 
sees unbelievers as people who are hungry to experience Christ's love. And a lot of times, people enter and exit our church doors because they fail to connect with them as people. We have failed to do that, and we must get better on this. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, Jesus saw the crowds, and he had a great vision. And he thought this, Man, I could get 10% of these people in my church. I am going to have a great kids ministry, a great worship team. We are going to rock this city. Okay, this is not exactly what he said, but I hope you didn't fail for my version of this verse of the Bible. I am a pretty persuasive guy if you, if you don't notice that, but this is not what it says there, is it? What it says there is this, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion to, do, to be moved in such a way that he thought in his insights, that something was wrong, that those individuals did not know the Father. On that very fact, we read in the verse, He was moved and had compassion of them, because they were, what, weary, they were tired, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Christ was touched by what He saw, because He was full of grace. Is your heart, full of grace or condemnation? That's my question for you through this event. Grace is the key for evangelism. And, and, and when I see myself as someone who was reached by a loving God who gave me what I needed and not what I deserved, I can look at the worst of humanity and say the same way, they need Christ, they need life, in the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember times in my ministry when I would try to reach someone with the gospel until they became so much of a, a hassle and so much trouble and so much time they were consuming for my ministry that I thought, do you know what? This is not worth it. This is not worth it. This is not worth my time. I'm going to do something else. I'm going to try to reach somebody else. This person is taking just too much of my time. Well, that was a very legalistic outlook of people that I had. We become so tied up to the expectation of other Christians that have for us that we forget what evangelism is all about. Evangelism is not about numbers. It is about changing lives. Let me repeat that to you. Evangelism is not about numbers. It is about changing lives. It is a fact that we ended up reaching more numbers of people with the grace of God if you practice evangelism. But this is not your main goal. Your main goal is to change lives through the grace of God. But when pastors get together, the first thing they talk about, do you know what they talk about? It's how big is their church. So how big is your church? How big is your church? Well, I have gone to some conferences that the whole talk is how many Baptisms, have you, have you uh, uh, practiced in your church? Which translates in churches that baptize people in numbers. And how much money you're bringing in. So it's all about people. It's all about money. It's all about programs. And very little about changing people's lives. So not how they are doing it spiritually. It becomes the focus in a lot of these you know, uh, uh, spheres that we... Uh, enjoy when we go to conference and things like that, but we must focus that people need to be reached by the grace of God. But what are we doing? It's completely different, and we must change that. We don't talk about what the Lord is doing through us, broken people, to reach the lost. We talk about how this program or that program is getting people to come to church. Don't get me wrong here. Please, don't get me wrong. Okay? I'm not against programs in churches. Some of them are wonderful tools used by God, but don't forget what it's about. It is about God's powerful love being expressed supernaturally through me and through you. That is what evangelism is all about. This is how the Lord builds the body of Christ. It's not about programs. It's not about numbers. It is about you and me having 
at being a, a channel of His grace to reach people. A few years ago, I was dealing with a very difficult situation in my life. My dad was hospitalized, dealing with what probably was at that time, without me noticing, these last days on this side of eternity. He was close to his graduation. My sister was a very difficult person to deal with since I got saved. She always tried to put my beliefs down, make fun of what I believe. Uh, and I was talking to her a few nights before a dad passed away when she told me that she could not believe how peaceful he was. And I had the privilege of leading my dad to the Lord five years before he died. So I told her that Isaiah 40 verse 31 was in operation in his life at that very moment. To my surprise, he asked me, what in the world does Isaiah 40 verse 31 says? Which I reapply, apply to her. Reply to her. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. At that very moment, there was no more arguing with her younger brother or nasty jokes about my faith. There was only amazement in seeing a believer looking forward to his graduation to glory. That might be your craze right now. You might have someone in your family that is very hard to reach. Let me tell you something. Don't give up on them. Keep investing in loving them. Grace is the power that will make that happen if God wills it. And if you put yourself out there, they might believe because you put yourself out there. So don't forget that. And here is the number two reason why grace is the great motivator for evangelism. Grace turns evangelism in a real joy instead of a religious task. Grace turns evangelism in a real joy instead of of a religious task. For us to understand this point, I'd like to re read it for you, John chapter 4, verses 6, 7, and 9. And look what he says about this. Jesus, being weary from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? For, fews have no for, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So Jesus was tired. Jesus was thirsty. He, he still managed to make this conversation a joyful opportunity to introduce this woman to the living water, the Zoe, Zoe life, which is Jesus. So how, he did, how did he do that? Don't you wonder sometimes, why did he do that? Well, I do. And here's why he do that. I am going to say something that is going to be the number one reason why people do not like to share their faith. And here's what it is. I am telling you this by using Jesus' example. Jesus enjoyed evangelism because first, he enjoyed his intimate relationship with his Father. Let me tell you again this. Jesus enjoyed evangelism because he first enjoyed his intimate relationship with his father. The father became his living water, Zoe. He was excited about introducing people to his father because he himself had the joy of having a vibrant relationship with his father. So do you remember when you first came to Christ? Do you remember when you put faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in life? You realize that He loved you and you want to have a relationship with you. And then what did you do next? You became a little Billy Graham. That's what you did. No one could shut you up. And I mean no one could scrape from you. You were excited about your relationship with God. And that gave you the joy of sharing grace with other people. Do you know what God wants from you? God does not want you to grab a bunch of evangelistic tracks, go over your neighbors, and knock in his door, and make sure that he listens to the gospel. I know, I know this is what the conference is all about. But let me explain to you and you will understand. What he wants you to do 
he wants you to enjoy him he wants you first to enjoy him as he is enjoying you as his son as his daughter so he wants you to enjoy this wonderful relationship that we have today through his grace so evangelism must be the natural result of an invigorating, exciting relationship with a gracious God. So evangelism in your early years with Christ was a continuous, instantaneous expression of God's life within you. When Peter and John were arrested for sharing Christ, the leaders of Israel threatened and warned them not to speak in the name of Jesus ever again. But what they do, what do they do? Well, we read about this in Acts 9, Acts 4, verse 19 and 20. That's, that's what he says there. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the right of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. You be the judge. In other words, Peter and John were convinced that not to shed the grace of God through the Redeemer was much worse than die for their very faith. So a gracious relationship with our Heavenly Father inflames the desire to witness. He ignites compassion towards lost people and motivates Christians to naturally witness with the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit that it is within them. Friends, I hope you are listening what I'm saying here. And what I'm saying here is if you stop trying to convince yourself that you are have, you must evangelize and you start enjoying and living out of the grace of God, evangelism will flow out of you like water flows from a fountain. It is going to become effortless. It is going to be so natural that most of the time you will not even notice that you are being evangelistic with your friends and your family. And that is the truth. Just enjoy grace as God intended and share it with others and you will be amazed with the fruits. I'll promise you this because I have seen this in my own personal life and the life of people that I teach this. So he is another reason for grace to be the great motivator to evangelism. Grace number three. Num oh, reason number three. Grace motivates you to share a person, not a plan. Grace motivates you to share a person, not a plan. I do not intend to minimize the importance of Scripture in organization when you are sharing your faith. Not at all. But it is very much possible to share a plan of salvation without making clear we are introducing lost people to actually a person not a plan. So grace motivated evangelism does not leave a person with only the knowledge of the Savior, but it leaves the person in love with the person of Jesus Christ. Not just with the knowledge, but in love with Jesus. It gives the new believer the understanding that his identity has changed through his newfound relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If he was evangelized through a plan, his only basis for his assurance that he is in fact saved is by looking back to the moment when he made his decision for Christ, which is good. Not, not bad at all. But if he was made aware through a scripture that he was entering into eternal relationship with the living and dwelling Lord, his assurance of salvation rests on the fact that he knows Christ right now. And Christ knows him. Here's what Ephesians 3, verses 17 through 19 have to say about this. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length in the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God it is more than just a guide to people through some steps it is introducing 
these people into a relationship with the living God. Let me tell you something. As I go around in Brazil, in the U.S., talking about this issue and figuring it out what moves people, let me tell you one thing I found out. People are thirsty. And you know what people are thirsty for? They are thirsty for genuine, unconditional, authentic relationships. They might tell you otherwise. They might look like they don't need that. Okay? They don't want that. But don't be fooled by the appearances of their lives. They are thirsty. They are really, really hungry and thirsty for authentic, genuine, unconditional relationships. That's what they are. They are sick and tired of people that supposedly are their friends, but want something in return. Their boyfriend that want to sleep with the girl. The friends that want you, but they want you to, you know, conform in order for you to be affirmed and recognized among them. Or the mother who cares for the kids to see if they'll turn out all right. The guys that wake up every day to go to work to support the family, thinking that their work is their identity. The woman and the man out there are thirsty. They are thirsty for a relationship that's unconditional, that's genuine, and is authentic. And you can only find that with Jesus Christ. With nobody else, you will ever find that. I don't care who is your wife. I don't care who is, is your husband. I don't care how be well behaved your kids are. If you do not have an unconditional, think the genuine relationship with the Lord Jesus, these relationships will not be enough. They will prove to yourself that they are not enough. I have no doubt that people today are just looking for a relationship that's genuine and unconditional. And only God through Jesus can give them what they are looking for. And you and I have the privilege of introducing them to this God that loves them and want a personal relationship with them. There's no, more, no one out there more qualified than the son and the daughter to introduce others to their father. If you want to know a little bit about me, just find one of my kids and ask them, who is, who is Joe? Who is Joe when no one is looking? Who is Joe around the house? Who is Joe as your dad? Who is Joe? What moves him? I mean, what's his behavior when we are not around? You know better than we do. So guess what? That is a, that is a fact about me and it is a fact about you. You know the Father relationally. And because of that, you got what it takes to introduce him to others. Here is what I'm going to try to tell you today. There's no one more qualified than you as the son and daughter of the living God to introduce him to other people that do not have met him yet. So don't miss out this opportunity. You got what it takes. Just share your relationship your relationship that you have with him with other people around you. That's all he's asking. You know, and when you are enjoying that relationship, you don't have to force yourself to do it. You want to tell other people about it. You know, sometimes I get to meet friends from my kids. And then they come to me and say, well, your daughter tells me you're the funniest guy ever. Well, guess what? I didn't have to tell my, my daughter to tell her friends that I am the funniest guy in the whole world. You know, she just went ahead, and as natural conversation came about, she just shared with them about it. That's exactly what you and I are asked to do. We not ask for, you know, a great preparation to study hours and how to present the gospel to other people. Not here against that you do that, that you might memorize a plan of salvation of some sort. But the most important thing, when you are relationally enjoying your father, it is a natural result for you to talk about him with others. So here's the last reason for grace to be a great motivator to evangelism. Reason number four. Grace-oriented evangelism gives life. Grace-oriented evangelism gives lives. Many of us stress the importance of receiving forgiveness in order for a person to enter heaven when he or she dies. 
Yet, God's primary goal in reaching us is to share His very life with us. Forgiveness does only one thing. It clears the way for Christ to live in us. Forgive, not, forgiveness by itself cannot make new people out of us. It is a fact. It is scriptural. It is Christ in you that makes you a new person. Even though he cannot do that until you receive God's forgiveness through him, in his mercy, God offers forgiveness. But grace, brothers, does much more than provide forgiveness. It provides life. Elizabeth Elliot's response towards the man who killed her husband illustrates best what I'm talking about here. She went beyond forgiving them. He went, she went to the very man who she had forgiven and expressed love for them. I saw a picture of her giving a haircut to a man, to one of the men that murdered her husband. Now that is grace right there. Grace offers what we don't deserve. Lavish, loving kindness. To Christ, we are offered life, joyful, abundant, exhilarating, divine, liberating, eternal life. That is grace. Forgiveness is a necessary step toward the main goal, which is to receive and experience the divine life in the Son. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Colossians 1, 27. To whom God will to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Father of, of all, along with his plan, said this. I have a plan. The plan is to birth my son in every creature that we see them. That is the plan of God. But we need to be saved first in order for that to happen. It's actually part of salvation. Okay? I need not only forgiveness of my sins, but we need to be saved by the very life of Jesus, like we read in Romans. Okay? And that is the difference between every ideology and religion out there in Christianity. Christianity is based on the unwavering, unwavering truth that you and I and the Creator are one. That is the truth right there. And I have grown in my understanding of grace. And as you have grown in your understanding of grace, I hope you experience a great desire to share His life with those who are not saved. I explain to them that Christ died for us as I share the gospel with other people so He could live in us. But His final goal is to live through us. So as you share the Lord with other people, don't forget those very important facts. This is re reality for you and He wants a reality to be for others as well. As you share the Lord with other people, don't forget, He died for you. You die with Him. He lives in you, and He wants to live through you. And that is what is the gospel of grace is all about. Think with me for a moment as we close this time together. If What would happen if you today realize the truth that Christ lives in you, and want to live through you in reaching others. Just think with me for a moment. We would have, what I believe, a worldwide a spiritual revolution. What this realization would do to your personal life, your families, your relationships with people and things would be nothing but a miracle coming truth. Just think about this for a second with me. It would revolutionize you living in very real way. You will re revolutionize the way you see people, the way you see yourself in people's lives, the way you see yourself in God's hand in reaching others for Christ. As you live every day with the hope of reaching someone with the life-transforming message of grace, remind yourself 
of these reasons to share the gospel by the greater motivator, which is grace. Reason number one, grace compels us to see people as people. Reason number two, grace turns evangelism in a real joy instead of a religious task. Reason number three, God, grace motivates you to share a person, not a plan. And the last but not least, reason number four, grace-oriented evangelism gives lives. And that is what God wants to do with your life as you rely on Him and you trust Him to use you as you enjoy Him in this great journey of grace. I hope that this message will motivate you with His grace to go out there and you start telling others about the transforming message of grace that you already enjoy and they can also enjoy as well. May God bless you and may God use you in a mighty way. that uh, our hearts will truly be challenged in the area of sharing the gospel. Uh, as Joe mentioned, as, as Matt has said, as uh, Rob, Pastor Nix has said and others, we need to be about the business of sharing the gospel. Uh, we live in desperate times, and we have a message that responds to those desperate times. And tonight, maybe tonight you've been watching our program for the very first time, and you've been challenged by the message as well maybe perhaps have even made that decision to trust Christ uh, as your own Savior. And if you have, you know, we have a, a little booklet that we would like to send to you. Uh, it's just Beginning Your Life in Christ. And it's just a small booklet, a, a short booklet. It, it'll, it'll go over a little bit of the things that you've already heard and the decision that you made. And then it takes you a step farther, and it, it helps you to begin to perhaps understand. So many people say, I don't understand the Bible. I've tried to read it. Read it, and I just don't understand it. Well, it'll, it'll help you get started in that. But we want to send you this little booklet, and we also want to send you your own Bible, as long, and along with a couple other booklets to read. And all of it is entirely free. You won't be charged anything. Postage is free. Everything is free. All you need to do is write us a, uh, just a postcard. Send us an email uh, and say, I, I, I've made that decision to trust Christ as a result of hearing the broadcast. And just give us your name and address, and we will get that off to you. No one will call you later on and say, would you like to begin to support Bible doctrines? No, you know, we, we, we have areas for that, but we're not going to ask you to do that. Uh, we're, we want you to just have that material and begin your walk in Christ. Uh, and so if you've done that, please, please let us know. Let us send you this material and help you get started with your walk in Christ. All right? Because we'd like to pray for you. We'd really like to pray for you. All right? Now, but if, if you enjoy the broadcast, you've been, you're one of our regular viewers and you've enjoyed the broadcast or, or not a regular viewer, but hey, you found us and I really like that and I'd like to see more of that. Um, and you would like to support either the broadcast, like I said, all of us, Matt, myself, uh, Cindy, uh, Susan, uh, we all function on support like a missionary. We, are, we live by faith and, and God's uh, children to, to support us. If you would like to support us, uh, you know, $5 a month, $10 a month, $20 a month, uh, a one-time gift, that, any of it, that's all fine. Or you'd like to support this broadcast and the things that are involved in, in putting this on, uh, that's fine. On your screen there is the address. Just write to that address, Bible Doctrines to Live By, Post Office Box 564, Comstock Park, Michigan, 49321, and just write on there the broadcast fund or to support uh, one, of the, one of the people here in the office, uh, Joel, Matt, Cindy, Susan, you know, just 
just that's it's that easy. We'd like to this is a gift for them or a one-time gift or a monthly gift as God provides. Um, any of that will be greatly appreciated. So just keep that in mind. So all right, well that brings us to an end of tonight's broadcast. We trust that you have been blessed by our international online broadcast tonight. And so we will see you back here again tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock and maybe tomorrow morning at 9.30 for our morning coffee and bite of Scripture. So until then, have a great uh, rest of the day. Have a great day tomorrow. And may God truly bless and use you for His honor and glory. So until we meet again, we say keep looking up. Good night, everybody.